it is 2017. Just before I left on my first overland expedition through Australia, which was the Canning Stock Route, which was July this year, I did a quick calculation on a calculator on my computer. And I worked out that I have been driving off-road vehicles for 35 years. And that doesn't include the time that I drove with my father through Af bits of Africa. It's from the time I got my own vehicle and started doing it myself. And of course, those of you who know my work will know my first vehicle, my first love was a Range Rover Classic. And I've often said if I'd bought a, a vehicle that was uh, Japanese, maybe a Toyota Hilux, my life would have been made a lot easier and a lot less interesting. And I don't think I would have had the passion for it that I do now, had I driven a less interesting vehicle. And I call them less interesting because, well, we all know that Land Rovers, particularly the early ones, uh, I don't think this is the case anymore, but lots and lots of character and great performers in so many ways. And that's what I was kind of born with because my father had one and that was my start in this industry. But Toyota came along um, I got my first vehicle in, two, in, in 1982 and only started doing this kind of thing professionally in about 1994-5. My website was launched in 1996 and in 1998 Toyota South Africa contacted me and offered me a long-term loan vehicle. I'd become reasonably well known in South Africa for my work and um, I'd published some books and I was starting to do regular magazine articles and they approached me actually um, w the launch of the Land Cruiser Prado 90 which was the first generation Prado to be seen in South Africa but the second generation overall and uh, co called the Colorado in the United Kingdom. And um, going from Land Rover to Toyota was a big step for me, but it was, I mean, it was a wonderful opportunity for me because it was, it was, a, it was, an, op it was an opportunity. It was, a, it was recognition that what I was doing was valuable by a motor manufacturer. And this was amazing. And um, I, I jumped at it. I thought the Prado was quite good. I'd driven it on some off-road tracks and I'd been to some... Uh, events with Toyota themselves and it was an impressive vehicle. It really worked well and um, I, I took it and, I, and you know often we as four-wheel drivers if we're if we're brand loyal and I was enormously brand loyal to Land Rover at the time we tend to snub our noses at oh it's just you know oh it's only a you know it's not one of us kind of thing and that's very very common and particularly with, with uh, well, I wouldn't say particularly with Land Rover people, with, we all do it. Land Rover people, in myself included, kind of <clears throat> look down on other vehicles. Given <clears throat> the GX model, which was the basic model, Land Cruiser 90 had the uh, three litre turbo diesel motor that the um, K, KZTE engine. And uh, it was by comparison to my Land Rover Defender, uh, powerful. Um, it, it carried a load really quite well for an SUV. was really comfortable. Compared to my Defender, it was immensely practical and comfortable. And I really liked it. I, I really did. And I, I, I was impressed by this vehicle. So much so that um, I, at the time I was starting my family and I was building a house, I thought, I'm going to invest in this full time. I'm actually going to sell my Land Rover. And I did. And so my relationship with Toyota began then. And it began with uh, that vehicle. And um, I have some stories to tell. It was a very, and it still is a very positive relationship. I don't have a relationship with Toyota at the moment and haven't had for the last four or so years, three or four years, because um, I no longer deal with them. Uh, Australia, I sent them a few things about what I was doing, got nothing back, n not as if they're just not interested. Uh, Toyota UK, supremely not interested. I, I, anyway, I won't go into details. And bought this myself, 
Uh, my only relationship with Toyota now is a relationship with my local dealer that has been doing me a few favors here and there and service great, excellent. That's as far as it goes for then, for, for now, right now. But back then, it was a very, very serious and meaningful part of my business. Sold a Land Rover, drove, started to drive my, uh, my lone Toyota and kept it for a year. Soon after, oh, no, it was actually while I had it, they needed it for something and I had to give it back to them for two weeks or something, right, in the, right at the point. I don't know why. Um, I vaguely remember, but I remember it was during that period and I needed to do a trip. I wanted to do a trip to Zambia and Botswana and, uh, oh, no, that, well, they didn't have one and it was big, big, big panic. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. we'll find one for you. And they found one belonging to um, a chap called Von Krauser who was running the Continental Off-Road Academy in South Africa at that time. And uh, while Von and I got on reasonably well, I wasn't impressed with the school because I thought a lot of the techniques they were teaching were very poor and some of them were absolutely wrong. But nevertheless, they had a good tight knit relationship with Toyota as well. And I was loaned Von Krauss's Land Cruiser Prado. He also had a Prado on loan, a press Prado on loan. And uh, I remember packing it up and leaving Johannesburg. We had to have a roof rack fitted because mine had a roof rack and it was all of this big thing uh, to get it ready and left Johannesburg and it broke down. And uh, we got about three, four hours north of Johannesburg and went into limp mode. And I crawled into the service station at a town then called Petersburg. Polokwane? No, it's not Polokwane, is it? I don't know. Anyway, all the names have changed. And it hadn't been serviced since its first service at 5,000 kilometers. Hadn't been serviced in 22,000 kilometers. And that's why it broke down. Fuel, fuel system was blocked. Anyway, they changed all the filters, did the fill. Okay, and we lost a day. Not a big, not a big train smash. And then did an amazing trip through Botswana and parts of southern Zambia. And that was the vehicle, those of you who know my videos, where my, my friend Jacques and I got stuck on the salt pan and where we nearly died. Jacques and I, let me introduce you to Jacques. Give me the camera. He's the one holding the camera. He's very dirty at the moment. Okay. Jacques and I just, we've been filming how to cross pans. And we did something very stupid. We decided to try and get to a place called Kakonya Island. It's in that way, I'll show you now. We didn't make it. We got stuck. Well, let's put it this way. We got so badly stuck, I just didn't even film it. It, it, was, it was one of the few times I've been off-road where I've been l scared for my life and I've had to be very, very cool-headed about. We got stuck. It was incredibly hot. We were miles from anywhere. We were seriously bogged down on a salt pan. Uh, we had, it was our last day. We only had 15 liters of water in the vehicle left because it was our last day. We were actually on our way home we hadn't replenished our water because we didn't think we anyway long story short we got away with it through skillful and very purposeful methodical process of getting ourselves out of trouble which we did it is 50 plus out there i am nearly dead from exhaustion it's taken us about an hour hour and a half to get out we were lucky cool. and we discovered at that time that also that um, the vehicle had been driven through a lot of very tall grass and grass had collected in the radiator which we hadn't noticed until the vehicle was working very very hard on the muddy surface of the salt flat because the temperature just screamed up and we realized that the, between the it looked okay but between the air conditioning uh, condenser evaporator rather and um, the the uh, car zone vehicle engine cooling radiator there was just a massive grass so we had to try and clean that out and we had an amazing trip <clears throat> when I got back the I was given my Prado back uh, which was w w well looked after and then something happened that was quite interesting <clears throat> I was at a place called Stony Ridge Off-Road Academy and my good mate John Rich is one of the best, well certainly the best off-road instructor I've ever worked with and we I tr decided to try let's let me see if I can you know bring in guests to and, and I'll kind of 
be involved with John teaching you off-road driving skills and we had about six or seven other vehicles there and I realized at that time they wasn't terribly good at it um, I was a little bit impatient and where John is supremely patient and he was just he's just a very very good instructor but anyway we had a good weekend and there was a very very deep water crossing and I was demonstrating a water cross I took a I took a bad line through the water and I, the water just suddenly broke over the bonnet and the engine stalled and I had never been in this situation before and I remember reaching for the keys to restart the motor and I thought no hold on a minute whoa, 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 whoa. stop 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 bad idea really really bad idea and um, I shouted to John the water was filling up and I climbed out and the water was the the car was full of water and we pulled it out and then I, I was taught something really interesting that I didn't know. John taught it me. John, John ran this off-road driving school but he was also a ex a diesel mechanic, a mechanically very sussed. And he said, no, this is the way we have to sort this out. Firstly, we find out if the engine has ingested water. Out comes the air filter. If it's wet, the answer is yes, it has. Okay, you must make that assumption. The water has got as far as the air cleaner. It had. We then jacked up one back wheel, put it in fifth gear, rotated that wheel with our hands after removing the glow plugs. And water was, as the engine was turned over by our hands on the rear wheel, it rotated the engine and all of the water was squirted out all of the glow plugs. Glow plugs are easier to remove than injectors. And we made sure that it was clear. We cleaned out and was very, were very thorough in terms of the inlet manifold, making sure there was no more water. And uh, with the air cleaner out to dry, we started the engine and it started first, first tick. And I was taught that by John. And I wrote about it in a magazine article that I was writing. At the time I was writing for uh, Leisure Wheels magazine. And uh, there's more about Leisure Wheels magazine in my story about my, my relationship with Mitsubishi <clears throat> and I wrote about it and I also wrote about it in my own newsletter I had what's known as the 4 by forum which was my website which later became 4, 4 by overland or 4x overland I wrote about it and my, 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 my mate at Toyota he was the guy that actually at Toyota marketing he ran Toyota marketing at that time his name by the name of Roger Houghton and um, he was my boss at Toyota as it were and uh, at one of the Toyota functions he said I read that article so you drowned my vehicle eh and I was I must say looking at it I was very oh yes I'm terribly sorry sorry and he said no 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 you don't need to apologize it was a fantastic article what a great article that was really <laughs> so it was so I, I mean I really thought I was in trouble no the opposite and um, that kind of cemented my relationship with Toyota because from then we published we were publishing a trails book and we did a version for Toyota South Africa and we printed 5,000 of them and we then we also did the launch the launch of the Land Cruiser 100 I went on the actual press launch and I drove with a rally driver called Oppi Reinecke, and he was the, 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 the kind of Toyota's host. Every vehicle on a, on, a, on a typical press fleet, you'll go out and you'll have somebody, normally two journos, and then a third person that'll be a representative from the manufacturer with you in the vehicle. That is normal and quite common. And uh, this was Oppi Reinecke, the rally driver. And he taught me about left foot braking, not off-road. I'd been doing left foot braking off-road for a while. But he taught me about left foot braking on on tar road driving that was really interesting and uh, we had a fantastic fantastic day and we published a book for Toyota to in part of their big press release and I don't remember how many were printed but it was several thousand of a book which was a combination of uh, the trails book that Gun and I co-wrote and my 4x4 guidebook and we kind of combined the two took out all of the photographs that weren't Toyota's and compiled this book for them and so that was a commission and um, 
it's a it's a lovely book if you're a Toyota fan <clears throat> and of course had the press pictures of the Land uh, Cruiser 100 then they called it the VX it was a 4.2 multi-valve um, diesel engine in what they called the VX and they also had the V8 but that actually only came a little later and they had the 105 which had the 4.2 uh, normally aspirated uh, two valve per cylinder engine that we know the 1HZ that I know very very well and those vehicles were launched at that time then Roger Houghton left and my relationship with Toyota was never quite as strong as again there were a number of different people that took over from him I think I can think of three and none of them lasted more than about a year and a half two years and when the troop carrier was launched in South Africa was 2011 up to that point they had not sold them in South Africa at all and they and I basically and had done this with the 76 because that let's rewind just a little bit here the land cruisers that I had purchased because of our relationship I thought let me buy a land cruiser for myself because this relationship is, is very solid. I like the trucks, I like the vehicles. They're certainly good performers. Let me go the whole hog and actually let go of Land Rovers and go Toyotas. And that was, a, I suppose, the main reason why I moved from Land Rover Toyota it was, to Toyota. It was, a, it was a financial one, it was an economic business one. And I bought a Land Cruiser 79 it had a 1HZ engine, uh, but the old style front and the old style dashboard. And it was a, uh, and I bought a, a pickup, two door pickup. The four door 79 or four door Land Cruiser pickup, Ute, was not available at the time. But I had it converted into a four door. So it was now a four door Ute. And there was a company in South Africa called uh, Miano and Son doing um, conversions, remarkably similar to what Toyota now do. Really, very, very similar in shape, design, very, very similar. And uh, they did a good job, and, but I didn't like the vehicle because it was just so grossly underpowered. Well, that's the end of our Land Cruiser conversion story. We began with a two-door Toyota Land Cruiser pickup, built it into a four-door double cab, added a multitude of fittings from suspensions, bull bars, and winches, the cruiser comes with a choice of two engines, a 4.2 diesel or a 4.5 petrol. I feel I made a mistake here. I chose the 4.2 diesel. Trouble is with the additional weight, it became quite a sluggish vehicle on the open road. Aftermarket turbos are not really a practical solution for this engine. In any way, turbo modification increases fuel consumption to that of the petrol. So why not buy the petrol in the first place? And uh, didn't keep it for particularly long. Uh, then I, once I sold that, I then got a, um, you see, I was lucky because of my relationship with Toyota. I would, as soon as a new vehicle was launched, uh, they, or even, even just a press fleet, I would, I would go to Roger and say, can I have one of your press vehicles? And I'd get it at a really good price, not cheap, but, I, but a very advantageous price. But they were press vehicles and press vehicles were often a bit, uh, they were a bit abused. The press don't look after four-wheel drive vehicles. They're actually not notorious for damaging four-wheel drive press fleet vehicles. And, uh, but I would get, and I, and I got um, the, the pickup I didn't get. I bought that new, but they gave me an extremely good price uh, through one of their, their dealer, their own fleet dealership system. Uh, I bought a 105 that I got a really good price too. It was brand new, but it had the 4.5 petrol engine in it and um, it was a wonderful vehicle. I, I still love the 105, but that vehicle was so, so thirsty. So, okay, just a quick little anecdote of how thirsty that vehicle was. I did everything I possibly could to improve its fuel consumption. And one of the things I did was I chipped it and I added a, um, I did. I had the head worked um, with all of the valves that had a four valve per cylinder engine, all of the hulls ground and the inlet manifold ground and the whole head worked. So this thing really pushed power, pushed a lot of power. 
and I did a whole another exhaust and this was to improve fuel consumption made no difference not I I barely measured half a percent difference if there was a difference was, in fact it was so low I couldn't even state that it was actually improving it on a trip from my hometown in Cape Town to a place called George which is east six hours I left at three in the morning for a conference for a big off-road conference I'm not a fast driver I'm just not a fast driver I generally drive I'm happy with the speed limit I just I just am but this particular occasion late at night I burned it and I was sitting at 140 I suppose I might have hit 170 on the clock once or twice but I was sitting at a good 140 150 160 the whole way mountainous roads and this engine just performed and I got 15.6 liters per hundred kilometers the best ever fuel consumption I got with that vehicle when I turned it around I stayed there then that one night the next following day I went back to Cape Town six hours there was what they call in Cape Town as the southeaster blowing the southeaster prevailing southeaster wind I had a wind a tailwind blowing me but it was now ordinary you know Sunday afternoon and I drove at the speed limit and 18.2 liters per hundred kilometers it just it doesn't make any sense I know it doesn't make any sense but that's what happened so now uh, that was my so then I sold my my uh, petrol 105 and bought a 76 also with a 4.1 a 4.2 the H one uh, HZ engine a little bit underpowered but it was a lighter vehicle and I quite enjoyed that vehicle but then I thought you know I just loved the 105 I wasn't in love with the 76 so I actually bought a used 105 diesel and that vehicle also one a one HZ engine and I loved that vehicle and I did my may I did so many major trips in it I did um, I did my searching for the Okavango my longest ever expedition and ah, what a fantastic truck that is I absolutely love it it's a little bit on the heavy side but but just comfortable and practical and I and I, I sold it uh, I think I had it for about four years and I sold it after I got my first troop carrier and it was a reluctant sale but the troop carrier was such a big project and that happened in 2011 and again I went back to Toyota and I said you've got the the troop carrier you're launching the troop carrier uh, can I have one of your press vehicles and he said okay I'll tell you what we're gonna do uh, we've got two press vehicles we're gonna organize you one of them and I said but I want to what I want to do is I want to organize the following deal I want to keep it for one one year and then I'll buy it from you less depreciation and I worked out costs and everything and I reckon I'd get it at a good at a good deal and he said yes so having said yes plans were put in place I was going to get me a troopy but I knew that this bill this was going to be more than just get me getting a vehicle and then getting some accessories and bolting it onto it and making it into a, an overland vehicle this was going to be something very very special and the the chap that was then running marketing at uh, he, he was a bit he was a difficult guy to get on with and I and I think that he I don't want to say negative things but um, I think he found the job a bit of a challenge where where, where Roger was just this natural per just you know just things had just they just happened with this other chap it was it was more of a challenge and it was more of a challenge for me to you know kind of well you you you, you said this you know we've got it in writing you know because there was a long time before between that and actually getting given the vehicle and I remember there was a big motoring show in Nazareth which is big expo center south of Johannesburg and uh, I would get the vehicle after that so I actually went to the uh, the Nazareth showgrounds and the, there was no there were no troopies there at all and I thought what's going on here I was kind of my heart sank well I was supposed to get the one at the showground and there wasn't one at the showground and what it was <coughs> was that my one actually had been used as the 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 photography vehicle the vehicle that was being being used for all the press shoots 
and uh, apparently that's why it wasn't there but they had a whole lot of other Toyotas there but anyway that's what happened and eventually I got my vehicle and I was very relieved because there were many times where I thought oh this is just not going to happen so when it did happen oh, wow and then I, I my challenge was and this is kind of less to do with my relationship with Toyota than my relationship now with other people that I depended upon for building the troop carrier and um, it's the build of the troop carrier was is in a separate video uh, linked above but uh, that process was quite new to me because I actually started a business in South Africa that I would actually consult for people and build vehicles for clients and it turned out I wasn't terribly good at it not that I I didn't struggle building the vehicles. We built some beauty. We built some beauties. But um, I had a partner join me, and that didn't work out because he just. Um, it was one of these. Uh, he he just basically took over, and uh, I wanted to do it this way because of my experience and my learn knowledge. And you know, no, we do it this way. No, we do it this way. No, we do it this way. And so I thought, well, what the what am I doing here? What what, what is it all about? This is one of the reasons why it it, it failed, because <clears throat> I wanted to do it a certain way, and I you know, and it had started with I want to build an the ultimate Land Cruiser camper, overland camper, it, just a, such a beauty, such a brilliant, brilliant vehicle. And I came up with the idea of the lifting roof. I came up with the in, uh, with the internal bed. Um, and this was all something that I had I'd worked on and I hadn't actually I didn't realize that they were doing this in Germany I hadn't seen any pictures and when in the middle of this somebody said to me have you seen the ones in Germany I said, why are they doing it in Germany yeah they've been doing it for years in Germany do you want to see the pictures and I said no 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 I do not want to see the pictures please don't show me the pictures this is what I want because this is going to be amazing and I think I was actually right because I still think the Alucab Hercules is better than anything made in Germany in terms of practicality and just it is it's the best I've seen anywhere I'm not talking about the interior designs and things like that but just the mechanism and system for raising the roof and everything it is as good if not better than anything I've seen by any manufacturer anywhere and I don't think I'm saying that just because I helped design it I just think it is anyway and my idea was to have this incredible incredible truck and uh, my business partner no we'll do this oh, I can do this oh, we can do this oh, I'll do it much better I'll do it much better I'll do it this much better I'll do it this much better and it just took the wind out of my sails and I thought oh you know I thought I was going to enjoy this process of innovative and interesting and dealing with clients and finding out what they want you know what do you want to do with your vehicles what kind of trips do you do the kind of load do you want to carry but the distance blah, blah 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 you know and then building these vehicles and I had enormous trouble in some with some of the uh, the uh, equipment retailers in South Africa that I wanted to use some of their products and some of them said to me well you take everything for us from us or you take nothing and uh, when I said well that's that that's not the point of this project the project is that I can that I can cherry pick the best and I'm not linked to any specific manufacturer or brand that's the point because if you go into this shop they'll sell you this brand this shop that brand this shop that it's exactly the same in Australia and so you, know, you as the buyer need to actually go to the different places and pick and choose and, and, and a lot of people do they get a lot of information from all over the place and they do that but I wanted to be able to do that and say my experience with this particular vehicle these springs and these shocks and this bull bar and this winch and this thing and that thing and that shower and the, all of these and things and I, I, I pushed through I pushed through I pushed through and um, eventually my business partner and I just we, we split up and uh, I remember when the troop carrier now it's not the one behind me for those of you who don't know my history it's the one that I built in South Africa from 2011 12 13 and in 2014 took it to the UK and it was actually sold in the UK in 2015 this morning into the snow that vehicle I remember uh, with great great pride and joy 
it was the big getaway show. The getaway show is the big over, uh, it's a four by four travel show held Johannesburg uh, at the beginning of every September. And my vehicle was going to be on show. I was, I had partnered up with a big retail, um, uh, camping retail company, and my vehicle was going to be on show. And I remember, and it was the first one of its kind. And I remember as I reversed it into this spot under the lights, there were four or five of these guys, including my ex-business partner, standing there, <clears throat> jaws agape. They couldn't believe what they were looking at. And I thought, yeah, you know, you just, you, you're so prideful, everything, you know, you, you just, like, you're like this. And instead of like this, you're not like this at all. You're like this, you protect, you know, no, 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 no. The people that I built it with, and Alucab is one of the major ones that I built, that worked with me on the, on the truck. They didn't do that. They said, what have you got in mind? And they'll say, well, do it like that. I remember them talking about the roof, we'll put it like this. And then they said to me, we can take the roof right to the front. You can? Yes, there's no reason why we can't. Really? Because I hadn't drawn it like that, you know? And uh, I remember the bed thing that comes down, saying to them, well, um, the pillows are going to fall down, which is a problem with a lot of the German ones. Your pillows are going to fall down. So oh, we'll just put another latch in there, which they did. They subsequently made it a bit wider from my prototype and they've made some tweaks. But that's, and, and I was, I tell you, when I looked at those people and I shook their hands as if there was nothing between us, you know, and they shook my hand and turned around and walked off. And I remember looking at the look on their faces, they could not believe it. This vehicle was gorgeous. I was told by three individual people at the show that this was the most impressive vehicle on show. Okay, and I guess in a way it was because it was different. It was new. It was the first time in South Africa, and um, it didn't win any prizes with the with the organisers as best vehicle because you have to ha have spent a lot of money on a very very large stand to hope to win best vehicle prize. But um, it was a great sense of accomplishment to me personally that I had built this truck, and subsequently. Um, I built a few trailers for that. I never built another troop carrier for a client. But I know of several people that actually, uh, there's, there's uh, Bush Law campers who came to see my vehicle and immediately ordered three or four. I know several people that actually were, uh, my vehicle was parked at a Toyota dealership down in Cape Town for a while. And people actually just saw it in the window and looked at it and went in and ordered. And, and so it was a win-win-win situation across the board. Until, of course, now, as I said earlier, I don't talk to Toyota at all. I have no relationship with them at all, even the people in South Africa. I have to mention, though, that the final bit of relation, the relationship in South Africa was finally closed when they, after not one year, but three years, they were changing people and this and, can, oh, can you keep it for another year? Sure, I can keep it for another year. I don't have to pay for it for another year and, and the depreciation. I've still got full use of it. And I'd done the conversion and everything. So that was very And then a third year. Yes, sir, I don't mind at all. So right at the end, when I went to Johannesburg to finally settle up, I went to see the people there and they said to me, thank you very, very much for what you've done. We've loved the work you've done. Um, and in fact, they, they didn't hand me the keys. I remember clearly now. They said, we've looked for the spare keys and there aren't any. I said, oh, that's a point. point. And she said, no, that's actually not unusual. I'll tell you why. Yours was the first of two to enter the country. They're used for homologation and photography purposes. And they normally don't come with second keys and a service book. Very common. So we're, now we know it's yours. And they said, no payment. And I like to tell people about that because at the time I was living in England and things were quite tough and that vindication that my work was valuable to Toyota and that was, that was wonderful. And in fact, uh, something on a personal note here, it was that vehicle that I had in the UK 
that enabled me to come to Australia because I sold it for quite a lot of money. And uh, I had made all those programs, all those videos, enjoyed the vehicle thoroughly and learnt an enormous amount about troop carriers and, and what they're all about and this conversion. And I've now replaced it with a brand new one. So they're happy and I am ecstatic with my new Toyota. This is my, let's go through, 79, 105, 76, 105 troop carrier. This is my sixth Toyota, sixth, sixth Toyota Land Cruiser. Breakdowns, I have had, uh, I've lost a fan belt on my 1HZ uh, 105. I lost fan belts on three separate occasions. I used to carry spares. And I found out that in fact, the only reason why that happened was the genuine Toyota fan belt was not genuine at all. I bought from a Toyota dealership. It wasn't. I actually took it broken. And the shape was wrong. So it generates a huge amount of heat because the shape is wrong. Okay, how about that? That was interesting. Um, and I had uh, some timing problems on my 1HZ, my 76. And I had a immobilizer failure on my 105 1HZ. And to conclude the story about my relationship with Toyota, I'm going to tell you about that breakdown. Um, I remember it was four days before my epic finding the Okavango trip. I went to, took my daughter to her to stables, dropped her off, went in to start the car, and the car wouldn't start. It just would go, nya, 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 nya. nice healthy battery, healthy starter motor, nya, 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 nya. no, didn't fire. Which with a diesel engine, that means no fuel. If it's cranking well and not firing, it has to be fuel. There's nothing else. Why wouldn't it have fuel? Broken fuel pump. Why would the they don't break? I mean, one HZ oil fuel pumps, mechanical fuel pump. They're so reliable. These things just they really go on forever. Immobilizer. Click the immobilizer on off and got it. Eventually got it to start. Went back home. Wouldn't start again. Playing, 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 playing. Next day, tried to get it. Got it to start. Drove it to the. Uh, my local Toyota dealership. Stopped it there, called the mechanic over and said, okay, is that an immobilizer? I said, yes, Mr. White's immobilizer. Um, well, let's see what we can do. Because I, I knew the, the, uh, one of the people there quite well and he was very helpful and, and he, he, he said, don't worry, Mr. White, we're going to help you out right now. Because generally speaking, the service is pretty good, I suppose. I'd certainly seen quite good, quite this is about to ruin it. Went into the workshop. Uh, yes, Mr. White. Um, we'll um, we'll sort you out now. We're just gonna we're just gonna. And the bonnet was open, and they were walking around it, looking inside, poking around. Now I know this engine bay. Engine. What are you looking for? ECU plug. I said, I beg your pardon. Uh, we're looking for the ECU uh, plug so we can put in the diagnostics. Yeah, but it's a 1HZ. Yes, Mr. White, don't worry, you sit there, sit there. And now they're starting to be condescending. So I eventually, <laughs> I, I, an hour later, no, nope, we've nope, just got to find the ECU and then we'll do a diagnostic. Doesn't have an ECU. Eventually, I called the workshop. I said, bring the workshop manual over here. And I, and, I, and I remember face to face. And I said to him, I looked at him in the eye and I said, please, please, please listen to me. Listen to the words I say. I know for a fact the vehicle does not have an ECU. It doesn't have one. And I remember, you know, so please stop looking for it he said uh, yes mr white uh, one moment please he went out came back and said we're terribly sorry you're right it doesn't have an ecu that took an hour i had phoned my wife and said Gwynnie, please can you bring me my toolbox she had arrived about the, soon after the altercation with the service manager 
I then walked into the where my vehicle was and opened the bonnet. Uh, one of my Mackies there had given me a, a, a lead light and I had now traced the wire to the immobilizer and I was figuring out how to remove the immobilizer because I had made that deduction that it had to be the immobilizer. A voice behind me as I'm lying over the engine. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Um, can you can you tell me what you're doing? And I looked at him and I said, "Are you a are you a auto are you a auto mechanic uh, a, a, a auto electrician?" He said, "Uh huh." They just phoned me and they said we've got a they said we've got a customer going mad. I said, "Did you tell him it doesn't have an ECU again?" Yeah, <laughs> they had phoned him. They, the Toyota dealer, had phoned the auto electrician to find out if this thing had an ECU. And then they'd said, please come, we've got a customer going mad in the workshop. I said, <laughs> I said, it cranks, good starter motor, no firing, okay? Pump, immobilizer. It can't be anything else, am I right? He says, yes. I said, do these things pumps break? He said, not very often. I said, do the immobilizers break? He said, every now and again. And I jumped off the stool and he climbed in there and I said, have you replaced one of these? Have you uh, sorted one of these signs before? And he said, yes, I have. And climbed in within 15 minutes. He had the uh, immobilizer out and we ran the jury wire. So now the vehicle had no transponder immobilizer at all. We rigged, we bypassed it. And I did my trip and I was actually very grateful because imagine if that happened a week later, I would have been absolutely... No, I wouldn't have been completely because I knew what it was. I, but I would have had to do a major, a major breakdown in the middle of Angola, which wouldn't have been fun. So that's my relationship with Toyota. And I, uh, I thank you for watching. I hope it hasn't been a little bit too long winded. Um, but I still very much a, a, a land cruiser man, not necessarily a Toyota. They make good cars, but I think the land cruisers are special. And I particularly like the fact that Toyota are making vehicles suitable for proper rugged off-road extended travel overland trips and not a lot of manufacturers are still doing that and for that I'm very grateful thank you for watching if you would like to be part of what I do and help me make more videos support me on patreon click the patreon button on the screen now